Fallujah, west of Baghdad, the rebel's bastion seems to be awakening the day after an earthquake. Eight years after the war, its inhabitants are still living among the ruins. At Fallujah Hospital, doctors are fighting another war. Today, as every day, the maternity unit is on alert. A deformed baby has just been born, the fifth this week. This newborn is suffering from serious malformations. The doctors think he will survive, but he may never be able to walk. From the opposite side, please. He needs an operation. At the moment, he's much too weak for us to move forward with surgery. So we have him on observation. Uh, we have seen many other types of deformities. He's not alone. Some are more severe than others. We have some babies born without skulls, without organs, and sometimes with their legs totally twisted. Oh, look, look at his little legs. The mother of this baby is in shock. This woman has had three children before this one, all born without any health problems. This deformed baby is the first such case in her family. But there's a dramatic rise in such phenomena. In Fallujah, one birth in five now exhibits congenial malformation. This doctor sees only one possible solution, and it is radical. I advise uh, the older women in, in Fallujah uh, uh, city to not have more babies. How did it come to this? All these babies were born after 2004, when Fallujah endured one of the most violent battles ever witnessed on Iraqi soil. Bombs and shells rained down on the city for several weeks. 15,000 coalition soldiers were marshaled to crush Fallujah. Facing them were 2,000 Iraqi resistance fighters armed with Kalashnikovs and rocket launchers. The US Air Force dropped hundreds of tons of bombs. Impact. These pictures show fireballs falling on the city. This is white phosphorus, a chemical incendiary weapon. Today, this bombing is said to have caused the malformations in the children of Fallujah. Baghdad, winter 2011. How can you tell whether a city is no longer at war? Perhaps by observing the passers-by, crisscrossing the streets. In Iraq, peace is gradually settling, but the stench of war is still noticeable. The Iraqi capital alternates between days of violence and days of peace. The US Army is committed to pulling out of the country by December. The police and the Iraqi army will step into its shoes. These traffic jams are an indicator of peace in Iraq. The city seems revived, with businesses springing up once again and residents doing their shopping in the city center. A city center that is returning to its pre-war opulence. But is the war really over? Though the situation in Baghdad has improved, other cities have been tossed into the garbage. Fallujah, for instance, my parents' hometown. After the war, the city was totally cut off. Only the inhabitants had the right to come and go freely. But I have family and friends there, and I speak Iraqi Arabic. I make contact with a friend in Fallujah. Come at 3 o'clock, close to the statue. I'll come and pick you up, and we'll go wherever you want. This is Abu Yunus. He's 32 years old, a former football player for Fallujah now unemployed. I first met him while doing a news report four years ago. It was he who called my attention to these seriously deformed babies. He came to Baghdad to fetch me because it's not possible for me to get to Fallujah without his help. This road is closely monitored. In traveling the 50 kilometers that separate Baghdad from Fallujah, we go through more than 20 checkpoints. The city is located in the middle of the Sunni Triangle, also called the Triangle of Death by the Americans. 
Some 1,500 U.S. soldiers have been killed in this region, one-third of the American casualties in Iraq. Fallujah was the first city to fight back against American occupation. It found fame by throwing them out of town and inflicting great loss of life. So much so that the people wondered how a small city like Fallujah could resist against the world's most powerful army. In March 2004, four mercenaries under contract to the U.S. Army were killed in their vehicle on the outskirts of town. Their mutilated bodies were dragged through the streets, then hung under this bridge as trophies. It was one of the very first acts of violence against the United States. These pictures were soon seen all over the world. It was the start of an escalation that culminated in the Battle of Fallujah in November 2004. The death toll listed 134 GIs and 3,500 Iraqis. Fallujah became a symbol of the revolt. Accordingly, the army imposed very strict checks in the city. The fingerprints and retina scans of every last inhabitant were recorded in U.S. Army files. Never has any town undergone such treatment. Residents were even issued with biometric ID cards. This badge enables me to enter and leave Fallujah. Seven years later, the badges are no longer needed. The city is now under the control of the Iraqi army, but Fallujah remains the hardest place in the country to get into. You need a, a guarantor to enter. And he must be from Fallujah. I've been asked to be responsible for you for safety reasons. So you can't just walk into Fallujah? No, 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 not like that. As we approach the city, the tension mounts in the car. No, stop filming. Put the camera down. Here we are at the entrance to Fallujah, 100 meters from a border post within a country. The Iraq army is checking each car that passes. To take in a camera, you'd need special permission and an armed escort. But to give us freedom of movement, we'd rather enter illegally. There are several cars in front of us. We're in the third one. We're waiting. Come and fetch us. Thanks to Abu Yunus, one of the soldiers lets us through. For his own safety, we don't film him. After an hour's wait, we finally pass through the checkpoint. Welcome to Fallujah. 300,000 inhabitants, considered the most dangerous city in Iraq. Nothing here has really changed since the battle. Life goes on, the streets are teeming, but the traces of war are still here and the Iraqi soldiers carry on patrolling. In this prison town, it's hard to keep a low profile if you're carrying a camera. So to keep us safe as we move around within Fallujah, Abu Yunus follows close behind. He'll be our guardian angel. This neighborhood is one of the hardest hit by the bombing. Half the buildings are in ruins. Not one wall has been spared by bullets. This former Iraqi soldier was in the city during the American assault. He lives just opposite this building, totally destroyed. During the bombing, he noticed suspicious explosions. Just after the bombing began, the landscape changed. Even the appearance of the sky changed. The sky became kind of yellow. It lasted for several days. Even the explosions were abnormal. Now, I'm a fighter. I was an officer in the Iraqi army under the old regime. I fought for seven years in the war against Iran. So bombs and missiles, I've seen a lot of them. I know what I'm talking about. But with these American bombs, it was different. They exploded and they produced something abnormal, something that I don't think I've ever seen before. The strange bomb that this resident refers to contained white phosphorus, a chemical incendiary weapon often compared to the napalm used in Vietnam. According to the Geneva Convention, 
civilians and civilian objects may not be attacked in any circumstances by incendiary bombs. Basically, the use of white phosphorus is banned in any populated zones. The American Army claims to have used it only to illuminate combat zones. Yet in Fallujah, thousands of inhabitants were still in the city during the bombing. Abu Yunus arranges to meet me at the Martyr's Cemetery, a former football stadium. 3,500 bodies are buried here, resistance fighters and civilians alike. This is where Abu Yunus played football. Today, he comes to meditate at the graves of former teammates, now become martyrs. Some of the footballers who, who used to play in this stadium are, are buried here. Even the coach, we called him Khalil Cowboy. Even he was killed by the Americans. In all, I think 13 players from the Fallujah team are buried in their own football ground. This man is the caretaker of the cemetery. One day in November 2004, while burying the victims of the fighting, he made a strange discovery. The Americans brought me sacks. At first, I, I thought it was humanitarian aid. But when I opened them, just look what I found. Bits of bones and clothes intact. Their translator told me these corpses weren't American. And that's why they'd give them them back. The caretaker recovered close to 500 unidentified bodies. He photographed each one before burying them in the cemetery. So we asked the doctors, and they told us that if there are only bones and the clothing is intact, then it's because of white phosphorus. And what happened to this man? Well, it looks like it's due to a chemical weapon. I mean, God knows what it is. But that's phosphorus, too. The caretaker is in no doubt. These men were killed by white phosphorus. Did the U.S. Army use these weapons against the population? What are these photos really hiding? To find an answer, I must go to the United States. Far from Iraq and its ruined buildings, Boston. I made contact with Ross Caputi, a 27-year-old former Marine who fought at Fallujah. Though he looks like a teenager, Ross Caputi is already a war veteran. Traumatized by his experience, he decided to testify. This is me. This is in Fallujah. And uh, I'm really embarrassed to say that I'm kind of posing for this picture. Um, you know, I had the bandana on and I wanted to look tough. And, you know, this is the mentality that we had while we were in there. Um, we were tough war fighters and, um, you know, these are the type of pictures I wanted to go home and tell my friends about. In Fallujah, Ross was a radio operator. It was his job to relay information to the other soldiers. He was therefore on the front line. Before the ground siege actually began, they told us that this was gonna be the biggest battle since Hue City, Vietnam. They were bombing the city really, really heavily at this point. And they put us on this hill outside the city, kind of overlooking it the night before, before the ground siege began. And at this point, I, I remember very clearly seeing the white phosphorus. Um, and I remember very clearly, like, having this weird feeling about it, like, this can't possibly be legal. I, I remember seeing it, like, sway down in the wind like this. I asked a lieutenant close to me about it. Um, I said, hey, is this, is this legal? And he said, yes, it's legal because we're using it as a smoke screen. We're not using it offensively. And there were thousands of civilians who couldn't leave the city. So wherever we used it, there was a strong possibility that this was going to land on civilians. So white phosphorus was indeed discharged above the population. Now I feel really guilty about it. Um, now I'm, I'm fully aware of how many people I hurt and how many people we killed. So now it's not easy to live with. Ross Caputi decided to quit the army after the Battle of Fallujah. He set up an association to make American public opinion aware of his experience as a soldier in Iraq. 
I remember that in my unit, there was very little curiosity about who these insurgents in Muj were. Everyone just seemed content with the rumors that we had heard about them being terrorists and Ba'athist diehards and anti-Americans of all different sorts. Though Ross Caputi denounces the use of white phosphorus, others in the military are glad of it. In March 2005, an American army major made surprising revelations. In this army review, he claims that the use of white phosphorus proved highly effective in Fallujah. He adds that he used it willingly against the insurgents. The major refers to such deployment as shake and bake missions. According to this officer, white phosphorus was used in Iraq to kill. Given this damning evidence, the international press seized upon the story. They would have to wait until November 16, 2005 for the American administration to officially admit to the media that the city was bombed with white phosphorus. Back to Fallujah, seven years after the bombing, the population is convinced that white phosphorus is still killing. Such is the case with Khalil. He lives in the Jolan neighborhood, one of the hardest hit by the bombing. In 2005, Khalil founded the first charity for war victims. His aim? To gather as much information as possible, beginning with these files on sick children. This child, for example, developed a brain tumor just after the bombing back in 2004. And it's the same in this case. There's a, a serious malformation problem from birth. So we record the information, we establish a, a medical file, and then we send it off to the doctors and charities. All we really want to try and do is find a solution and, and help these poor families. It's a modest office. Khalil doesn't have extensive resources, not even a computer on which to record all this information. He seems overtaken by events. You know, we knew absolutely nothing about any of these diseases before. When the Americans came here, they were supposed to bring us modernity. Instead, they've sent us back to the Stone Age. Khalil agreed to supply us with the files of sick children. He says that most cases of rare illnesses concern children under 10, like Ziad. He was born after the 2004 attacks with a serious malformation. He is the first case of this type in his family. He was operated on when, when he was 47 days old. The house we lived in was bombed. When we returned, I cleaned the place entirely. Maybe it was because of that, uh, I don't know. Your house was bombed during the battle? Yes, it was hit by a missile and half the house was destroyed. The living room, my bedroom, all of it was destroyed. The furniture, too. All we had left was, was what we're wearing, was this wardrobe. We rebuilt everything ourselves. One year later, my, my son was born with a malformation, and I was told it was linked to the bombing. How long did you stay in that house? Two years. We, we left the house a year after I gave birth. Why are children who were not alive during the war and who were therefore not exposed directly to white phosphorus victims of malformations? What do the Iraqi authorities say? Is it a public health problem? In Fallujah, only the Ministry of the Environment was willing to talk to us. The truth is, we haven't been able to do any environmental surveys. I mean, it was impossible to carry out any tests at all. The bombing started in 2004. Then once again in 2005 and 2006, all the way up until 2010. It was only in 2010 that the Americans left the city. And at that time, if a citizen bent down to pick something up, for example, well, he looked like a potential bomber. And an American sniper might even shoot him. And that happened several times, I can tell you. All this to say, 
It was nigh on impossible for us to go to any of these zones with our equipment and carry out our tests. It was far too dangerous. In Fallujah, nobody has the means to investigate the causes of these illnesses, not even the Iraqi Ministry of the Environment. This upsurge in deformed children isn't among the authorities' priorities. The former rebel stronghold has been sidelined by its own government. A code of silence reigns in Fallujah. Since the end of the war, just one study has shed some light on this. It was carried out in Fallujah in 2009 and was published in a major medical review. This document contains worrying results about the rise in the number of deformed babies. They reveal an explosion in such cases since 2005, one year after the Battle of 2004. Aberystwyth, on the west coast of Wales, the author of this paper is Professor Chris Busby, a British scientist specializing in radioactivity. He's secretary of the European Committee on Radiation Risks. Chris Busby is a regular mainstream media guest. In his Black Beret, he has become an easily recognizable figure on the BBC or Al Jazeera. He was recently consulted on the consequences of the nuclear crisis at Fukushima. Unlike the Iraqi authorities, he has investigated in Fallujah. But the way around that is to just knock on the door and say, excuse me, I'm, I'm asking have you, uh, how many people have got cancer here in the last five years and who lives here? You know, it's very simple. Because if you know who lives there and how old they are, you can, you can then predict how many cancers they should have on the basis of the national average and rates and so on, and just compare them with the numbers that they report. And the one divided by the other is a relative risk. So we did that. Did you try to go by yourself to Fallujah? No way. I've got too many people after my gut, so I'm not going to go and stick myself out there. Somebody will pop a bullet through me. So, um, how, how did you... Did you uh, yeah, no, well, I, all I did was I told them what to do. I said, look, I'll tell you what to do. I'll create the questionnaire um, based on the ones I've done. And even for an Iraqi team recruited by Chris Busby, the task was complicated. There's some places they went to, they got beaten up because they thought they were from the Secret Service or the state or the CIA or something. So then we had to start sending people around with uh, some local person that everybody knew, counselor or something. And after that, it was OK. And we just finished it when the Iraqi government found out about it. And then they put out something on the television saying we were terrorists and anybody who answered the questions would go to jail. But it was too late. We'd done it by then, you see. Well, we had, you know, lots and lots of... On top of the questionnaire, Chris Busby asked for samples of soil and water. Samples of residents' hair were also taken. The test results are astonishing. In these hair samples and the soil samples and all, we measured 52 different elements. So we looked at strontium and barium and neodymium and, and cobalt and ca copper and cesium and calcium and you name it, we looked at it. And what we found was that the only element there that could explain that level of congenital malformations and cancer was uranium. He believes it's not the white phosphorus that is harming the inhabitants of Fallujah, but uranium. So, for instance, in Fallujah, the rates of, uh, the rates of leukemia, for example, are 38 times the expected number based on Egypt. Breast cancer is more than 10 times. Childhood cancer is 14 times. I, I forget the exact details, but they're huge numbers. There's no, like nothing that you have ever found in any epidemiological study anywhere, ever. This is like the highest rate of, of, of genetic damage in any population ever studied. It's worse than Hiroshima, yeah. Why is Fallujah compared to Hiroshima? How did uranium come to be in this city? Officially, no nuclear weapons were used in Fallujah. I continue my inquest in Champaign, Illinois, 200 kilometers from Chicago, and home to Doug Rock. Join help. Come on in. <laughs> For Doug Rock, the presence of uranium in Fallujah comes as no surprise. 
This former high-ranking officer served more than 35 years in the U.S. Army, in particular during the first Gulf War. At that time, he headed a research program into the consequences of a new uranium-based weapon. After testing on behalf of the Pentagon, he became its first victim. He now suffers from several cancers and renal problems. It is part of the Nevada test we did. And uh, what I'm doing is uh, blowing up, shooting and burning up. But what you see is the direct impact on the uranium munitions, the uranium impact, but the uranium that breaks up burns and burns and burns and burns and burns for a long time. You can see how long it lasts. He claims that uranium has been used in American munitions since 1991, in missiles, shells, and armor plating for military vehicles. And when I shot up wood four by fours, man, they were great. Oh, this stuff is good. Okay, I mean, you have to understand the purpose is to kill and destroy, and uranium weapons are the ultimate because it's a massive fireball of burning uranium fragments that are moving extraordinarily high velocity and fragments that are not burning that cause massive secondary explosions or massive fires in anything that will burn. Uranium is a mineral used in nuclear power plants. Part of it is enriched and used as fuel for the reactors. The rest is radioactive waste, known as depleted uranium. As the costs of storage are high, the U.S. Army decided to use some of it to manufacture munitions and armor plating. Doug Rock sees depleted uranium quite simply as a nuclear weapon. And yes, it is. It's solid radioactive waste. It's chemically toxic. It's radioactive, radioactive for eternity. It's a dirty bomb. And yeah, it is. Yeah, let's call it nuclear for what it is. It's nuclear waste used to kill and destroy, thus contaminate air, water, soil, and food that remains there to cause harm for eternity. This weapon was used for the first time in Iraq in 1991. At the time, the U.S. Army asked Doug to inspect the tons of burnt-out Iraqi tanks destroyed by depleted uranium missiles. This is measuring the contamination on destroyed... Uh, As a result, Doug and his team were seriously contaminated by inhaling okay. uranium dust. Today, Doug is one of the only survivors of that group. Now, I mean, you can look at me. I mean, what I looked like then, I was a lot different. Extraordinarily healthy, and now everybody's extraordinarily sick. This is me right there. Yeah, we were the best of the best. Won't lie for him anymore. It's not worth it. Too many people are sick. Too many people are dead. Since this photo was taken, 21 members of his team have died. Returning from Iraq, Doug submitted an unfavorable report on the use of depleted uranium. Well, once I told the US Army that it was dangerous, we couldn't clean it up and they couldn't do it, they sent me packing. <laughs> they said, adios amigos, you know? We don't want to hear from you. We don't want to talk to you. I mean, you got your job. Keep doing things, but shut up and go away. The U.S. Army never took Doug Rock's recommendations into account. They use it in Fallujah, so you, you think there is a... Fallujah, extensively in Fallujah, totally extensively in Fallujah. Not a question. And we see everything in all the other people, and we see every place that's been used, we see it. I mean, you could try to clean it up, but you can't. That's what I tried to do, and I couldn't. That's why I told them no more. To find out more, I try to reach Colonel Peter Newell. He was in command of the Battle of Fallujah in 2004. I never managed to obtain an interview, nor would he even answer the phone. I think that you can answer your questions, but I'm, let me give you my email address, and you can send me your questions, and you can get your answer. The issue appears to be embarrassing. The only answer I receive is a link to the US Army's internet site. This article praises the merits of depleted uranium and minimizes its dangerousness. The only allusion to health consequences is contained in this phrase. The Department of Defense and many other organizations have studied and continue to study the health, chemical, radiological, and environmental effects and exposures of depleted uranium. That's all they wrote. To the US Army, the use of depleted uranium is taboo. I did manage to speak to one former high-ranking official at the Department of Defense. Bing West was with the Marines at the Battle of Fallujah. He later wrote a book, recognized in the U.S. as the reference on American strategy in the rebel city. You heard about uh, the depleted uranium? Oh, 
the white phosphorus. Uh, what can you say about it? It's all nonsense. Uh, depleted uranium or something. A, a, a bomb is a bomb. Um, it's not like somebody's leaving behind radioactive so that the Marines walk through, I mean, radioactive fields, then all the Marines die. If any scientists show a linkage between lingering health problems relative to a military weapon, then that military weapon should not be used unless there's an extraordinary reason. However, if there is a lingering problem, the first people to be affected would be the soldiers on the battlefield. And I know of no soldiers who are complaining about uranium. Yet it's not that hard to find American soldiers contaminated by depleted uranium. A few kilometers from New York, Gerard, Janice, and their children are to all appearances a typical American family. You're gonna get me tired, man. Apart from one detail, in 2003, Gerard Matthews served more than six months in Iraq. A truck driver, we transported uh, what you call like blowing up equipment. Things move around on the truck, so we have to tie it down. So that's when uh, susceptibility of being exposed or, or sleeping in that environment with your trucks, because you know some of the missions don't take just one day, it takes more than one day. Gerard fell ill several months later. The early symptoms seemed trivial, standard headaches, problems with his vision, but his state quickly worsened. The beginnings of a brain tumor, renal problems, the list is long. I have uh, leakage, and I'll show you uh, to the extent how much I have leakage. Today, Gerard has to wear diapers, but there's worse. His daughter, Victoria, conceived after his return from Iraq, has a deformed right hand. This picture is a reminder of Fallujah's deformed babies. His story has made headlines all over the world, but Gerard isn't the only one to fall ill. Eight of his comrades in arms who served in Iraq have shown the same symptoms. Urine tests reveal an abnormal concentration of uranium. I never was told about depleted uranium in the military. I never attended class. I never showed, never went to a class on how to handle equipment that were exposed to it. I didn't even know what you depleted uranium. The last time I heard, not even depleted uranium was when I took chemistry. Yeah. Gerard believes he was contaminated during his mission in Iraq. He decided to file a formal complaint against the U.S. Army, claiming it broke safety regulations by exposing him to radioactive material. His wife has gone even further. She wrote every senator and like almost every representative, and everyone was basically, um, this is just one of them she wrote, was sending back letters. At the time, know, even Georgia. President Bush's office had taken up the issue. On behalf of President Bush, thank you for your letter. He's thanking me for the letter I wrote to him about my daughter. And he said, the White House is sending your inquiry to the following agencies, Department of Defense, Health and Human Services, and Social Security Administration. That's the correspondence we got from them. No assistance was provided, nor any response to these questions. I feel they owe him an apology because to, to this day, he, to an extent, he loves the Marine Corps. I, I don't understand why, but he always says that if something happens to him, he wants to be buried in his Marine Corps uniform. <clears throat> and, and that upsets me because I, I don't understand how faithful he is and how committed he is, and I have to respect his wishes. So for me, I don't understand how the government can actually um, treat a man that way that still, to an extent, honors his country. The Army refuses to recognize its responsibility. Six months in Iraq were enough to shatter the lives of Gerard and his family. In Fallujah, thousands of inhabitants still live in these buildings destroyed by American bombing. Seven years in a contaminated city. Fallujah's hospital is short-staffed and cruelly lacks medical equipment. Nothing can be done to save these children, so to keep evidence of their births, a photographer has been drafted in by the doctors. Who 
Why are you photographing them? Why am I photographing them? It's for our database. We try to keep it updated every month. These photos are unbearable. Most of these babies will only live for a few hours. Every month, 20 or so babies like these are born and then die in this hospital. Not to mention the countless newborns with serious illnesses. You see, most families would rather the children died. I remember one day a father said to me, each time I see my deformed son, I die. A generation sacrificed, and how many more? For these children, it's already too late. Faced with this human catastrophe, the Iraqis are powerless. But to prevent the tragedy of Fallujah from happening elsewhere, some people in Europe are starting to take action. In London, a stone's throw from the Houses of Parliament, Bunny Easton camps out on this pavement every day. He has been campaigning against the war in Iraq since 2005. His spot at the foot of Big Ben is well chosen to attract both Londoners and tourists. Behind him, photos of deformed babies are exhibited for all to see. Shocking pictures that attempt to boost public awareness. We aim to expose not just the wickedness of war, it's the wickedness of the weaponry. The shells of the bombs and rockets, the bit, outer bits of the armored cars, all made of depleted uranium, left over after they've made the atomic bombs. I mean, we've got uh, a poster there uh, entitled A Different Nuclear War. The slogan and the slew of Iraqi baby photos haven't managed to rally great support. But Bunny Easton isn't alone in his fight. Others are campaigning on a different scale. An NGO network present in around 30 countries is also campaigning for a ban on all depleted uranium weapons. Its headquarters are in Manchester. So I could maybe um, show you some of the materials that we campaign with and some of those from our other organizations. So we have uh, briefings, which because it's a very big and quite a complex issue, DU, so we try and pull together all the necessary information into an easily digestible format. This was a, a briefing which we produced for members of parliament in the UK a few years ago, so this is the national campaign, uh, and we held a parliamentary briefing there. Um, it's always a challenge to try and get the politicians up to date uh, on the issue. Douglas is all too aware of the consequences of uranium-based weapons. He has studied the subject since the Balkan War in 1994. In that time, he and his team have devised a method for identifying and decontaminating bombed zones. His first battlefield was in Bosnia, where the Americans were already using depleted uranium weapons. This is a map of a place in uh, Bosnia, which was a site where DU weapons were used in 1994, 1995. But there were quite high levels of contamination at this site. So we've been doing quite a lot of work around that just to try and map whether DU has been used. In Bosnia, the organization identified 12 highly contaminated zones. This information enabled the Bosnian Environment Ministry to take steps to limit the damage. So this is one called Borovac, which was decontaminated in 2007. As you can see from here, it's a pretty extensive task that they have real problems in trying to identify the actual sites where DU is. That's a D round that's been dug up and it started to break down in the soil. Yep, so the yellow you can see on the outside is uh, uranium oxide and so with about 300 grams in each of the penetrators. Collaborating closely with the local authorities, Douglas was able to work freely in Bosnia. In Iraq, the situation is much more complicated. The problem that we see is that um, there are probably three quite different kinds of contamination in Iraq. Um, you'll have the contamination from the tank ammunition that obviously children quite enjoy playing on old war wreckage. And so that was one problem in itself. Then you have uh, 
DU from aircraft strikes where you may end up with a lot of contamination in the soil. Um, then you'll have another kind of contamination from the armoured fighting vehicles which again fire a, a, a small calibre round and that will definitely be within built up areas. So you have three different kinds of contamination. All of this needs to be mapped. Um, but at the moment, the US hasn't released data on where it's fired any of these weapons. And this is you know, a huge issue. This is a shot from to obtain this information, militants have demonstrated outside the American embassy in London. But the US Army still refuses to provide it. In the meantime, the NGO is attacking the British government, also accused of having used depleted uranium weapons in Iraq. Recently, these accusations have even been taken up by a British member of parliament during a session. The leader of the House may have seen today's distressing reports about the increased rate of birth defects in Fallujah. Can we have a debate about this issue so we can hear from the Foreign Secretary what representations he is making to his US counterparts about this appalling legacy of the Iraq War? In 2010, the British Ministry of Defense finally admitted the use of depleted uranium in Iraq and supplied the United Nations with information on the zones targeted. The U.S. ally is beginning to voice its doubts on this weapon. Only Belgium, Ireland, Costa Rica, and New Zealand have formally banned uranium in their arms. But today, no international convention even mentions depleted uranium in its texts. This allows the U.S. administration to continue using it without fear of reprisals. At the Illinois Law Faculty, Francis Boyle claims that the USA can be hauled before a tribunal. This lawyer and Harvard graduate has an international reputation. Agent Orange in Vietnam, Gulf War syndrome, war trials are a specialty. Today, Francis Boyle is locked in a new battle to have the use of depleted uranium recognized as a war crime. Uranium munitions violate the uh, Hague regulations of 1907, and then uh, DU also violates the Geneva Protocol of 1925. Um, so use of DU is clearly uh, a war crime. So if is it illegal, why is it used? It shouldn't be, but why does the United States use uh, uh, landmines? Why? You know, we're trying to stop it. Uh, the, the problem is how, uh, you know, how do you bring uh, the rule of law to bear on the United States government? Um, it's very difficult to do, and especially on the Pentagon. They're, you know, they're a law unto themselves. That's why it's so hard to bring the United States to heel. He sees isolation on the international stage as being the only way forward. I think if we can get all the parties to the Geneva Protocol to send in that letter to the French government. Now, apparently, even the British are willing to go along with this. Um, and, and the U.S. then is the only outlier on DU. Just maybe they'll say, OK, let's, let's stop using DU. Uh, Francis Boyle's cause seems a desperate one. The United States continue to make use of uranium in developing their military arsenal. In 2003, one year before the Battle of Fallujah, Donald Rumsfeld, then Defense Secretary, made a reference before the U.S. Congress to the use of a new weapon, the Hellfire missile. The new missile can take out the first floor of a building without damaging the floors above and is capable of reaching around corners, striking enemy forces that hide in caves or bunkers. This declaration went largely unnoticed, but it heralded the development of a new missile that would be tested during the early days of the war in Iraq. Some experts did react to Rumsfeld's declaration. One of them was arms researcher Di Williams. This scientist is a member of the UN Institute for Disarmament Research. He claims the Hellfire missile is a new generation bomb. It was used several times during the Battle of Fallujah. The experts call it a thermobaric weapon. They were using small tactical weapons, but they wanted these new thermobaric weapons, which are specifically designed for very local killing. And what they do, I mean, if somebody is right in the target of it, they just get fried. It is so high temperature, it just burns everything. 
Um, but also if they are within maybe 50 meters, it will also kill them because you, you, get, you get a bang and it sucks all of the air out. And, and so you, you get a pressure wave which goes high pressure and very low pressure and the air pressure goes down to maybe 10% of normal. And if you're in that area, you, your lungs collapse. You can't breathe. Di Williams has not only analyzed the photographs of the bombing in Iraq, but has also listed the new types of thermobaric bombs developed by the US Army. Once again, they remain very discreet as to the use of uranium. We have nine different new weapon systems going from 100 kilos up to 2,000. And if you look in, in, the, in the report, all they say is dense metal, where it says dense metal warhead, dense metal ballast, high density payload. When you realize what they're trying, they're using every word they can excepting uranium. But they're saying this is a secret heavy metal, but they never say what. According to Di Williams, these thermobaric bombs were showered on the rebels who had taken refuge in houses in Fallujah. Now, if this kind of, you can see how much smoke and contamination, that's a mixture of concrete dust and bomb dust. If that is using uranium, then you've got 500 kilos of uranium dust in that area, or at least spread over that part of the town. Um, and they're celebrating, and they don't realize that they're looking at their own future cancer. And, and uh, it is just, ah, it's so sad. Hell yeah, bitches! <laughs> See you in fucking hell, dog. See you in fucking hell. My biggest question for Fallujah is probably that it was an experimental area for new thermobaric explosives, probably uranium, possibly other new um, chemicals which we haven't even thought of yet. Um, and so this is where looking at, at the birth defects, we have to question which systems were used. Was my parents' hometown of Fallujah used as a laboratory by the U.S. Army? How long will Iraqis have to suffer the consequences of the war? The Bush administration boasted of waging a clean war, but it continues to sacrifice generations of children, both in Iraq and the United States. In Fallujah, two to three deformed babies are born every day. Most live but a few hours. The space in the cemetery reserved for these victims grows steadily.